the ulama, the people of knowledge, were always the, the ones who protected this deen from change. And what we see in the first few generations of Islam is that the ulama were dynamic in every sense of the word. They were charismatic, uh, they were leaders, um, they were brave, uh, they were deep thinkers, they were well-versed in the religion. So if you look, for example, at, at in the first generation, people like uh, Aisha bin Abi Bakr radiallahu anha and Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, we see a, a people who were on a completely different level. You know, they were brave, they were intelligent, they were well-rounded uh, in the knowledge of the deen and the dunya. Uh, they, they were outspoken. They were able to meet the challenges of their time. So, for example, when the Khawarij came about, Abdullah ibn Abbas went to them to debate with them and, and actually won thousands of them over back to, to, to proper Islam because he had the capabilities of dealing with, with, the, with the issues of his time. And we see this throughout the generation. So, for example, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, uh, we know that uh, the correct Aqidah was preserved by him because he was able to rise up to the challenge of the Mu'tazilites and face them and, and preserve that correct Aqidah that, that, that we continue to hold on to uh, until today. And we see this going on and on. But it, what happens with the later generations is a, uh, a decline in, in knowledge and, and in methodology. So about 500 years after the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the ulama began to develop curriculums. And they began to develop very set methodologies of study. So, you know, the, the curriculum for studying Islam became like a, a six-year program or four-year program, depending which part of the world you are. And there were set subjects at set levels. And the goal and purpose of this was to provide structure and to provide and to take the student on a journey, you know, from nothing to a beginner level student of knowledge. Two things happened over time that caused the problem. Number one is a lot of people began to think that after this four or six year journey, they are now ulama and they don't need to study anything else. That's a problem because really, if you're studying Islam, what you learn in four to six years is just the beginning. It's just the basics. You're not a scholar. You're a beginning level student of knowledge. But a lot of people come out of these programs thinking that they are the ulama, that they know what's right, they know what's wrong. And they never study anything beyond that. They come out as parrots, really, just parroting what the teachers taught them. The second problem that came up is people began to look at the curriculum as if it's everything. That, oh, our teachers chose these books. These are the only books I'm going to study. You know, some people even going as far as to say that, you know, reading any other book is haram. You know, you have to stick to what our teachers taught us. So we find that in later generations, a methodology of, of taqlid, of, of just blind following of, of the teachers developed amongst the ulama class, where to such an extent that in the late Ottoman era, ijtihad was actually prohibited. It was actually illegal for a scholar to do ijtihad. And there were actually ulama who were arrested for doing ijtihad. And the, rea the reality is that in every day and age, there are new problems, and new problems require new ijtihad. So the ulama will not be trained for ijtihad. They were not. Uh, they were not even allowed to do it. And what we had instead was just blind following. Alhamdulillah, in the past hundred years, a lot of institutes came about that focus on the revival of the early methodology of studying better, of studying deeper, of thinking or deeper, of being more authentic in your knowledge. And IOU, Alhamdulillah, is one of these institutes where the focus is on studying deeper and, and, and gaining authentic knowledge and not just being a blind follower. However, what you will find with students is sometimes students will become blind followers of, of their teachers, even at, at the institute where the goal is to train people to think higher, because that's just, I think it's just human nature that if we don't study beyond, we get caught up in blind following. So what, what, what we find in the Muslim world today is that a lot of us uh, who choose to study Islam, we adapt a very narrow study of Islam. So narrow that we find ourselves unable to deal with new problems. If the problem did not pop up in the curriculum, right? And the reality is if you graduate, for example, in 2010 and it's 2022 now, in those 12 years, a lot of new things popped up that were not in your curriculum. So you have to be able to deal with the problems of your time. 
And what the curriculum is it does is it's supposed to give you the tools that if you understand it properly, if you if you master those tools, you will be able to solve future problems. The mistake many of us make is instead of mastering the tools, we just memorize the books. See that that's where the problem comes in. There's, there's a very beautiful quotation that I just want to share with you uh, from one of my favorite books of the past century, The Road to Makkah by Muhammad Asad. And before I share this quote, uh, just the uh, disclaimer that Muhammad Asad in some of his later works adopted a lot of modernist ideologies. So I, I don't approve of that. But these earlier works like The Road to Mecca are really amazing. Uh, so The Road to Mecca is actually his autobiography where he narrates his life story. And it's a very powerful story that hit me. You know, when I read this when I was young, it, it really changed my whole mindset. And I like sharing this with anyone who is studying Islam because I feel it's, it's important to know this before you get into your studies. So in the story, Muhammad Asad at one point, he's traveling to Egypt and he, he meets one of the ulama at Al-Azhar University. And this alim, the scholar tells him, do you see those ulama over there? The ones who are just eating up the printed paper, you know, meaning they're just memorizing it. They gobble it up, printed pages, pages from books written centuries ago, but they do not digest it, meaning they do not understand it. They no longer think for themselves. They just read and repeat and read and repeat. The students listen to them only to read and repeat generation after generation. Muhammad Asad asked the Sheikh, Al-Azhar is the seat of Islamic learning. It's the oldest university in the world. In every page of history books, you know, you, you find him talking about this university. Doesn't it produce great thinkers and, and, and theologians and historians and philosophers? And to this, the Sheikh replied, it stopped producing those several centuries ago. Here and there, an ind independent thinker might arise, as will happen. But on the whole, the Muslim world today is suffering because those ancient thinkers, their way of thinking is gone. And instead, we have people just repeating over and over again their opinions as if the opinions are infallible truths. If there's any change for the better, thinking must be encouraged instead of blind following. So it's a very powerful passage where one of the shayuk of Al-Azhar recognizes the problem. And this is about 100 years ago, almost, I'll say about 60 years ago. He recognizes that in our generation, people are just blindly memorizing the opinions of their teachers and thinking that that's knowledge. And he's saying for the ummah to revive and, and to regain its, its past glory, we have to go back to being thinkers and not just blind followers. You see, when it comes to studying Islam, you get three types of students who graduate from an Islamic studies program. You get the lazy student, the one who just goes in there, learns just enough to pass, graduates, goes out, calls himself an alim, and you know, tries to get famous of the religion or whatever it is. But really, they don't know much. They just, they just barely pass their exams you know, each semester. Uh, don't aim for that. Don't aim for that, right? But then you get the dedicated student, you know, the one who works hard, make sure they get all A's, make sure that, that you know, they, they, they pay attention in class, that they graduate with a good report card. Alhamdulillah, that's better. That's better. But what you'll find also is a lot of these students who, who do that, they, they still just stick to, to blind following. So they're good at memorizing. They're good at passing exams. They're good at repeating what the teacher said, but they haven't internalized it. They don't understand it on a deeper level. It's just memorizing for exams. So they will be better for the community than the lazy student, but they're not going to solve new problems. They're not going to have the capabilities for dealing with new problems as they arise because they are just used to memorizing and passing on what they memorize. And, and that doesn't work today. Right? That doesn't work today because every year there's new things coming about. Every year there are new fitness and there are new problems and new misinterpretations of the religion. And you have to be up to date with both knowledge of the religion and knowledge of the world to be able to deal with these new problems. So we then come to the third type of student. And this is the type of student that I advise everyone to be because this is the need of the time. Students of this caliber. What is the third type of student? The person of Ihsan the person of perfection, of excellence, the person who pushes themselves to be the best that they can be. This is the student who goes out of his or her way to master the topic, 
They don't just learn the textbook. They find everything. They, they try to research everything they can find on the topic. They ask the teachers for further read, research and, and reading material. They ask questions about the different opinions and, and the difficult topics. You know, they, they study from different angles. They study from different schools of thought. They are able to process knowledge on a deeper level because they're not limiting themselves. So, for example, if you look at, for example, the topic of usul al fiqh, now, if you just read a book of Hanafi usul al fiqh, you just know on a very surface level what Hanafi usul al fiqh is. But now, if you study that book with a teacher and exchange examples and challenge, you know, he challenges you, you know, to use the usul to solve problems, you begin to understand better how those usul al fiqh work in solving fiqh problems and contemporary issues. You go even deeper than that. You study the usul al fiqh of other madhabs. And you compare and you begin to understand, okay, the Shafis look at it this way, the Malikis look at it this way, the Hanafis look at it that way. I'm starting to understand how the different parts of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a have different ways of looking at things. And so you begin to think even deeper. And this is what we need today. We need people not just to dedicate their lives to study Islam, but to be real problem solvers and world changers. And to become that kind of person, you have to commit to be the absolute best student that you can be. When I was studying, one of my teachers used to tell us almost every week, he used to tell us this knowledge will not even give you an ounce of itself until you give it all of yourself. You know, the students of knowledge of the past, they would travel for miles just to learn a single hadith. And we can just sit in front of our computer and just absorb knowledge all day long. But that knowledge is not going to transform you if it's not accompanied with sincere sacrifice and thinking and hard work and processing and application. It's not enough to just memorize. It's not enough just to get good grades. The ummah needs mujtahids. The ummah needs mufassirs. The ummah needs muhaddisin. The ummah needs fuqaha. The ummah needs people who can meet the challenges of their time through the methodology of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is what we need. And we're not going to get that without effort. We're only going to get that if we, the students of knowledge, push ourselves to be the best that we can be. If we push ourselves to study harder, to study deeper, to study more, to, to go beyond expectations. And what I want to share with you today is five things you can do, maybe six, five or six things that you can do to become a higher level student of knowledge. Because if you become a higher level student of knowledge, then inshallah, you can also become one day a scholar. And this is very important to remember that you don't become a scholar from graduating from an Islamic studies program. You only become a scholar when the ulama of your time recognize you as a scholar. And that can take 20, 30, 40 years. It's a very, very long process. So, what do you need to do to reach beyond, to become dynamic, to become something more, to become greater than, than, you know, than, than people's expectations of you when studying Islam? Number one, you need to study longer hours than the average student. If you want to be a higher level person of knowledge, studying two or three hours a day is not going to get you there. Yes, if that's all you can do, then do that. Alhamdulillah, it's better than nothing. Remember, two hours a day, better than zero hours a day. But four hours a day, better than two hours a day. You have to find a way to study more. And it doesn't have to be hardcore study. You know, like maybe you're spending two hours a day on your modules, but then you listen to a supplementary series on the same topic while doing the housework or while taking care of the kids or while driving to work. You know, so you, you're not wasting that time. Rather, you are consolidating what you learned and building upon it. Um, you know, by absorbing it uh, more, more information. So one of the best things that you can do if you really want to become a higher level student of knowledge is to increase the amount of time you spend studying Islam. Now, think about it like this. If someone is studying for two hours a day, intensely, properly, and someone else is studying for four hours a day, just as intense, <laughs> intensely and just as, as properly, then that second person is absorbing twice as much knowledge as the first person. In one year, how much more knowledge will you have? You will have received double the amount of knowledge as the first person. 
right? If, if, unless Allah is blessed, the other one with an amazing intellect, right? To be able to process more in two hours. But we're talking about the average student. So we have to put in more time if we want to reach higher levels of knowledge. Alhamdulillah. Number two, point number two, ask a lot of questions. And we see this with the great ulama of the past. What separated Aisha bint Abi Bakr anha, from the other great females of the Sahaba? And it made her have a higher level of knowledge. There are many things, but one of them that, that the ulama point out was that she was very curious. She would ask a lot of questions. A lot of the knowledge that has reached us is from the questions of Aisha. It's the same with Abu Huraira. You know, he, he accepted Islam very late. You know, just like three or four years before the Prophet Sallallahu passed away. And he accepted Islam late, but he narrated the most hadiths because he was, number one, putting in more time than everybody else, right? Point number one, putting in more time than everybody else. Someone actually asked Abu Huraira, like, you know, did you accept Islam so late? How do you know more hadiths than me? Abu Huraira said, well, while you were at the marketplace working, I was sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi learning. So he learned more. Right, he put in more time. He came late and he was still able to learn more than everybody else because he put in more time. But number two, he asked a lot of questions. You will see a lot of these hadiths, uh, Abu Huraira asking questions and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replying to the questions. The same with Aisha, the same with Ab Abdullah ibn Abbas. They were very inquisitive. They asked a lot of questions. And this is where the real learning takes place. You know, the, the, your teachers, you will find that they get very happy if you're asking a lot of questions. Of course, if the questions are relevant to the topic, right? Because what this means is you are paying attention, you are sincere, you are working hard, and you are thinking about what the teacher said. You are thinking about what the teacher said and trying to apply it to the real world. This is what it shows when you're asking a lot of questions. And it's in the Q&A segments that real knowledge is built because that's when what the teacher was talking about theoretically now comes into real world application. Then the teacher may be talking about the principle of urf, of culture. And then you say, well, what about this situation? Does it apply? What about that situation? Does it apply? Now you're getting into the real world things. And not only do you benefit, but the rest of the class benefits as well. So asking a lot of questions, this, this helps you to think deeper. It helps you to process better. It helps you to apply the knowledge. It helps everybody else in the classroom as well. Point number three. Do not limit yourself to the textbook. Do not limit yourself to the textbook. If you've only read one book on Ulum al-Quran, or Usul al-Fiqh, or Aqidah, or history, then you are not doing justice to the topic. Ask your teacher for recommended resources. Ask your teacher for what other books are famous in this field. What books should I be reading next? Try to study at least three or four of the main books related to the topic that you are studying. This can be supplementary reading. It could be reading you do on your own time. It could be something that you read during, during the, the semester break. So, for example, if you are studying uh, Tafsir 101 and you don't have time for extra reading, make a reading list of all the other books available in English on that topic. And then during the break between semesters, read those books. So you get a different perspective. So they may cover different examples. They may cover other concepts. They may cover different opinions. You, your knowledge grows deeper in this way. So one of the best things you can do when studying a, a topic that interests you and that you want to go further in, that you want uh, a deeper knowledge of, is ask your teacher, what are the main books in this field that I should be reading besides this one? And try to get a list of four or five of the main books, minimum three of the main books in that field, and make time later to read them. Because in this way, you gain a more comprehensive understanding of the topic than someone who just studied one textbook. Point number four, study classes outside of your core curriculum. Study classes and attend classes outside of your core curriculum. And you will find this amongst the greatest scholars of every generation, is they didn't just stick with a curriculum. You know, when class time was over, when it was a break between semesters, or it was the weekend, or it was some free time, they were studying with somebody else. 
So they were gaining fiqh from three or four different scholars. And they were learning tafsir from three or four different scholars. And they are building their knowledge in this way. So you may be doing your bachelor's in Islamic studies, but also on the side, you are attending a local tafsir halaqa. And you are studying Arabic, you know, with one of your local teachers so you can get faster and more fluent at it. And you are sitting and learning tajweed with one of the teachers in your city so that you can master it. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not good to just limit yourself when it comes to studying if you want to reach the higher levels. Again, if you just want to, to graduate and teach what you studied, it's fine. But we're talking here about becoming dynamic by reaching a higher level. You're not going to get there by limiting the amount of teachers that you have. You have to go deeper. You have to go further. And sometimes this may include travel. Sometimes this may mean that, oh, so-and-so scholar is going to be in that city teaching a course for one month. Let's find a way to do it. Let's find a way to get there. Let's find a way to be his students. And these kind of experiences, you learn so much just from being in the presence of a scholar, just from spending a month in their company, just from observing the akhlaq and the adab. You know, it, these things are... are things that affect you, not just in terms of intellectually, but spiritually as well. So tip number four, find out other topics, either online or in person, where you can study this deeper and commit to doing so. And you could even, you know, if you know a scholar personally who has the time, ask him to teach you one-on-one. -on -one. Ask your teacher after class, you know, can I have one-on-one -on -one sessions to go deeper into this topic? Because I want to understand this field deeper. I want to, to master this field. And inshallah, maybe one of your teachers has the time to do that for you. But really, it's the students who've done this throughout history who always end up being the best of the best. Right? If you look at Imam Abu Hanifa's students, we have students like Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. He studied with Imam Abu Hanifa, but then he goes and spends three years with Imam Malik as well. And he brings the two together to form his opinions. We see this with Imam al-Shafi as well. He studies with Imam Malik. He studies with Imam Abu Yusuf. He studies with Lais Ibn Sa'ad and he brings it all together. He doesn't limit himself. He tries to go deeper by expanding his sources of knowledge. And this is one of the best things that you can do for yourself as a person of knowledge. Finally, my final tip, the fifth and final tip for anyone who wants to go deeper and who wants to become a true student of knowledge or uh, to one day perhaps even become an alim, a scholar who is a specialist in a field. May Allah help us all to reach there one day. The fifth and the most important thing, if you commit to studying Islam, commit for life. Commit to being a student for life. Don't say I'm going to study Islam for four years. I'm going to study Islam for eight years. No, I am a student for life. And this is something almost every teacher of mine told me, that if you want to be the best in your field, never ever think of yourself as a scholar. Just study and study and study deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper for the rest of your life. Alhamdulillah, I started studying Islam at the age of 13. I'm 36 now, so that's 23 years. Still studying every day. Still studying every day. And inshallah, I won't stop because I still consider myself a student after 23 years of study. So don't think after six years or eight years that you are now a alim, a mufti, a faqih, a mujtahid, a mujaddid, whatever it is. No, we are students. But to become the best of students, to become the best of students, we have to have the student for life mindset. That this journey of studying Islam, this is my life. That's what we all should think. The Prophet sallallahu said, whoever embarks on a path to study Islam, embarks on a path towards paradise. The path towards paradise takes your entire life. It's not a shortcut. It's not, okay, I studied Islam for four years, done, I'm going to paradise. It's not like that. It's, it's a lifelong journey. And one of the mu'ajizat, the miracles of Islam, is that there is like almost infinite knowledge about this religion. You can study Islam for 200 years and not be done studying. It, it just doesn't end. It's like this ocean of knowledge that never ends. So why limit yourself? Why, why stop? You know, this is actually a, a trick of shaitan. That after four or six or eight years, you know, shaitan comes to you and says, oh, you are a scholar now. You don't need to listen to them. You don't need to study with them. You don't need to read any more books. You go and give fatwas. You go and make YouTube videos. You go and tell people, you know, what's right and what's wrong. And they put this in your heart that you are now the authority. Uh, this is why so many of my teachers used to say, 
the day that you think you are a scholar, the day that you have failed to become a scholar. The day that you think you are a scholar, the day that you have failed to be a scholar. Because a real alim is someone who thinks he's a student for life. And I have teachers who are like in their 50s and 60s. And they still, they still sit every night till late at night studying the books of hadith, studying the books of tafsir. This is a habit they have for like 40 or 50 years. And, and they still consider themselves students. They don't consider themselves scholars. Uh, and these are the most knowledgeable people I know. And this, these are our role models. These are the people we want to be like. Those individuals who have committed their lives to the sacred knowledge. So yes, we want scholars. We want people who can change the world. We want people who can revive Islam. We want people who can solve the problems of our time, whether they are Aqidah problems or Fiqh problems or Tafsir problems. But that's not going to come without effort. There is nothing worth getting in this world or the next that doesn't require effort. You want to make money? It requires effort. You want to go to Jannah? It requires effort. You want to be a real alim? It requires effort. We have to work hard. And at the end of the bonus point, right? one more thing that you can do to help you become a scholar. Always make sure you are writing down notes. Don't just sit there and, uh, and absorb things into your ears. You know, just sitting and listening to the teacher. You're not Imam Bukhari. Maybe you are. I don't know. But I know I'm not. Most of us need notes. When the teacher is teaching, the person who is sitting there and thinking and writing it out in his own words and going over his notes and, 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 and you know, linking up examples and using those notes to, to, to memorize better and to consolidate things and to understand things better, that's the person who's going to get ahead in life. That's the person who's going to excel in that field. So make sure that you are not a passive learner. You are not just sitting there and listening to lectures, but you are actively learning by writing. And by the way, a psychologically proven that if you write by hand, you will remember it better than typing it on, on a computer. So if you want to, to, to learn even deeper, have physical books and actual pens and sit and write your notes by hand while the teacher is talking. And you will find that you will get more benefit out of that because this gets your brain thinking on a deeper level. It just sparks something in your mind that gets you thinking on a deeper level. So to conclude, we need ulama, we need dynamic ulama, we need people who can change the world. But to become that, <clears throat> you have to commit to the long term. <clears throat> you have to study longer hours, ask a lot of questions, study many different books in the field, attend extra classes, be committed to being a student for life, and take down notes. If we do these six things and we're making dua and we're worshiping Allah and we are sincere in doing this for the sake of Allah, then inshallah, inshallah, Allah will help us to one day reach that status. Allah will help us to one day become the kind of people that this ummah needs. But it's not going to come quickly. There's no shortcuts to becoming a scholar. You can't put a microchip in your brain and download Islamic knowledge and think you are a scholar. It requires commitment. It requires spiritual purification of the soul. It requires uh, hard work. It requires long-term thinking and vision planning. It requires deep thinking. It requires a good relationship with your teachers. There's a lot to it. But is it worth it? Well, the hadith says it, that the person who embarks on this path is on the path to Jannah. Is, is there anything more we want than Jannah? So this is the path to Jannah. And the path to Jannah is not easy. So we must be committed and we must work hard and we must push ourselves to be the best that we can be because the Ummah needs that. The Ummah needs us to be the best versions of ourselves. If we are all collectively growing to be the best versions of ourselves, inshallah, together, together, we will be able to help solve the problems of this Ummah. So ask Allah to guide us all to help us on this path of knowledge, to help us to study better, to understand our, uh, our, our religion better, to make us sincere scholars who are dedicated to the path of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, to protect us from deviant ideologies, to protect us from laziness, to protect us from, uh, from weakness, and to make us all from those whom he uses to serve this deen and to add all of that to our scale of good deeds on the last day. Jazakallah khair for your time and attention. We'll open the floor to Q&A now. Waqlu da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakallah Sheikh for your insights. It was truly inspiring. Now we have the question and answer session. 
you can turn on the raise hand option and you'll be uh, unmuted soon. Alternatively, you can send your questions in the chat box and we'll read them out to the shake. If you're on YouTube, you can also send it in the live chat. Assalamu alaikum. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay, there is a question in uh, YouTube. Uh, where we draw a line when it comes to the free thinking? <clears throat> That's an excellent question, right? So I said deep thinking, not free thinking, <laughs> right? Uh, you see, this is why we study the usul. If you're studying Islam, understand this is one of the most important points of studying Islam. It's not enough to memorize books of fiqh or books of tafsir. You have to master the usul, the principles, the foundations. If you master the usul of a madhab, so for example, you, you study, let's say, uh, Hanafi fiqh, right? So it's not enough just to learn the opinions of the Hanafi madhab, but to understand the Quran, the Sunnah, Ijma, the opinions of the Sahaba, Qiyas, Urf, Istihsan, how all of this works, what are the goals of the Sharia, what are the maxims of fiqh in your madhab, this now becomes your foundation. This now becomes your filter that you use for dealing with the rest of the world. This is what allows you to see what you can take and what you can't take. And this is why every field of Islamic knowledge begins with usul. If you look at your, your curriculum at IOU, fiqh 101, tafsir 101, hadith 101, it's all usul, it's all principles. Why? because that gives you the framework. If you have that framework, you can deal with anyone from any ideology and be able to take the good and leave the bad because you are operating on a framework of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jamaa. So for example, if someone comes to you and says something that goes against Ijma, you can say, hold on, I can't accept that opinion because we have the principle of Ijma, of consensus. If somebody comes to you and they, and they state an opinion that contradicts the Quran and the Sunnah, as understood by the early Muslims, you can say, hold on, that opinion is wrong because it, cont it contradicts X, Y, Z, right? But this is where the mastering of the usul comes in. You need to master the usul. It's not enough to just learn them to pass an exam. It's not enough to just memorize them. You need to understand them. They become your foundation. They become your filters. They become your way of thinking. And if you are able to think within the framework of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, so you have your principles of Aqidah, your principles of Fiqh, your principles of Tafsir, your principles of Hadith, then you are able to navigate the world. And you're able to remain firm within Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, no matter who you are dealing with and what you are dealing with. Right? So that, that, that is the essential key, is learning and mastering the usul of the deen. I hope that answers your question. There's another question on YouTube. Uh, I just qualified 12th grade. Now should I go to Islamic University to study Deen or should I first study worldly education then study Islam? Please answer. That's really up to you. That's, that's a personal choice, right? Uh, my advice would be figure out what's your life plan, what's your life vision. What, what, where do you see yourself in 10 or 20 years? And what do you need to do to get there? So... Ideally, I prefer that people study Islam when they are young because your minds are more fresh, you're able to absorb more and you're able to take that journey longer, right? So for example, I started when I was 13 years old. Most people don't have the advantage to do that. You have to only start when you're 19 or 20, right? But if you are at that age, that, that's a good age to start because what happens now is you start studying Islam at the age of 18 and by the age of 28 or 38, you now have by 28, you have 10 years of studies. By 38, you have 20 years of studies. And that all compounds, that all builds up. So you could study Islam and then after that, get a degree in something else or start a business and on the side, continue studying Islam. So you never stop studying Islam, but you get your usul and your foundations early and that guides the rest of your life. It guides the career you go into. It guides the, 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 the business choices you make. It, it, it guides... The, the, the choice of field of, of study that you choose because this gives you foundations. So there is no hard and fast rule here. But what I would say is 
because number one, we uh, if you if you start off young, then you are you giving yourself more time to study Islam. Number two, when you are young, you're able to absorb the principles and learn the language, etc., uh, much faster. Uh, and number three, it will help you with your other decisions as well. I would say prioritizing Islamic studies is best, right? So, for example, what happens if you don't have knowledge of Islam and you go to university and you study a field that's haram, right? You don't even know it's haram because you don't have the knowledge. And you spend seven, eight years studying that field and you graduate and every job in that field is haram. And then you study Islam and you're like, oh, it's all haram, right? So, I mean, that is possible. That can happen. There are people who have done that. You know, that you'll meet a Muslim who will spend his whole life working in a riba-based bank, never knowing it's haram because he never studied his religion. Either you've got the, the insurance salesman and he never never thought that his job is haram. So you have to have at least some knowledge before you go into the worldly fields. The more you have, the better it is. It's like I myself, you know, I first studied Islam. And then after that, I didn't do another degree, but on my own, I studied business. So now, alhamdulillah, I have my business and I have my Islamic world. And they complement each other. But because I studied Islam first, that guided my study of business because a lot of the business books I studied included a lot of haram advice. You know, they tell you to take interest-based loans and to pile up your money and, and, and compound the interest. And you need to use your Islamic knowledge to navigate all that. So it's never a bad thing to study Islam. Allah is going to help you. Allah is going to guide you. Allah is going to open doors for you. Allah is going to provide for you. Allah is going to show you the best way in life. It's never a bad decision. So at the end of the day, it's up to you. But personally, I feel it's better to study Islam young and build upon that whatever you do, whatever else you choose to do with your life. Okay, Sheikh, I have this question, Yani. This is from uh, myself, okay, mm -hmm. personal. Uh, I have observed two extremes. For example, okay, we come to know way of self, okay. Some people go on other extreme, like, okay, all madhabs are wrong. Yani, they give, like, they tell that uh, madhab, following madhab is like, they give the grade of shirk, okay. And mm -hmm. some people, they... Uh, yani stick too much to madhab. They don't want to come out of a madhab. But Islamic online university where it uh, without compromising uh, correct akida, correct way it teaches us toleration. Like what is your advice for the people who like go in two extremes? Okay, it's an excellent question. Alhamdulillah. So one thing remember Islam is the balanced mother of Right, there's always two extremes on every single issue in this world. I find it fascinating. On almost every single issue in this world, you always have two extremes and Islam is number one. So when it comes to the issue of madhabs, uh, we do have those who treat the madhab like it's a religion. Like, right? you know, this Molana in India 300 years ago said this. That's what we stick into until the day of Qiyamah. Can't be wrong. <laughs> that, that's a problem, right? Because he made that fatwa based on his place, his time, the problems and, and the culture of his time. It's not meant to be followed till the end of time. On the other extreme, we have, you know, those who are saying that madhabs are bid'ah and madhabs are shirk. No, that, that's, that's not what the madhab is. If you're thinking that the madhab is bid'ah or shirk, then you don't understand what a madhab is. A madhab is a methodology. It is a framework. It is a way of understanding the Quran itself. For example, Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, he would take the hadith very literally. If the Prophet said it, that's what he's going to do. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he would look at the hadith from the context of why. What did the Prophet mean by this? Now, is there a deeper meaning? Is there a reason behind this? Was it for that person or was it for everybody? So he would look at the same hadith in a very different way. They both were right. Both ways they're right. Abdullah ibn Umar's way became the Ahlul Hadith methodology, which became the Hanbali Madhab. Abdullah ibn uh, Mas'ud's method became the Ahlul Roy methodology, which became the Hanafi Madhab. They are both within Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Both ways are fine. The problem is when we don't understand what a Madhab is, so we think it's like a sect, we think it's like a, you know, like Shia or, or something like that. No, it's, it's nothing like that. It is a framework within Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah for understanding the Quran and Sunnah. That there are different ways within Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah for understanding the Quran and Sunnah. This is the way that I'm going to use. 
You know, some people prefer Abu Hanifa's way. Some people prefer Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's way. Some people prefer Imam Ashafi's way. That's fine. It's a framework. Within that framework, you're going to find hundreds of scholars throughout history, all of whom had differences of opinion with each other. If you look at the Shafi Mazhab, Imam Ashafi, Ghazali, and Dawawi, they had very different opinions from each other. But they all considered part of the Shafi Madhab because they followed the same methodology. The same with the Hanafi Madhab. You know, we have Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, Muhammad al Shaybani. Uh, later on, we have, uh, you know, like Shah Waliullah and uh, many other scholars, and they all have different opinions. And it's all considered Hanafi because it's all from within the same framework. So the correct approach is to consider Madhabs as frameworks within Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaah. Frameworks that help guide your research. Frameworks that help you from going astray, from going to extremes, right? Because these frameworks, they fit within what is known as Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, people who are trying to follow the Sunnah and the majority understanding of Islam. So there's, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when people take their mazhab like it's the deen. That's where the problem comes in. You know, where you have a fatwa from 200 or 300 years ago and you're treating it like it's the Quran. No, that's problematic. That's when you've now gone to hulu, to extremism in following a madhab. So as long as people are treating it as a framework, alhamdulillah, whether they are Maliki, Shafi, Hanafi, humbly, alhamdulillah, you know, we need frameworks because they keep us grounded. Uh, they prevent us from losing our minds, you know, and, and just picking whatever we want, however we want. Uh, but a framework is important and a framework is necessary. And that's why madhabs naturally developed over time. Right? That's why they naturally develop over time in every field. Right? In every field of Islamic studies, uh, we're just more familiar with the madhabs of fiqh, but really in every field of Islamic studies, you will find these different ways of, of interpretation. So I hope that that helps answer your question. Okay, there's a question in the chat here. Uh, how many people, there are many people with high qualifications, but they don't know how to communicate, use good words, they're tolerant. What's your advice? Oh, it's a very good question. I'm actually reading a book on the topic at the moment. Let's see if I can get hold of it. So this is a beautiful book I'm reading at the moment. I'm not sure if I can get it. There we go. In With the Heart in Mind by uh, Mikael Smith. So this is about the emotional intelligence of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a recent publication. Emotional intelligence. That's something that's missing in our curriculums today. This is part of the akhlaq and the etiquettes and the adab part of, of, of studying Islam. How do you process emotions? How do you display emotions? How do you understand the next person's emotions? This is something many of us didn't learn. We need to learn it. We can learn this directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he was a master of emotions. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a person who mastered emotions. He would, he would look at a camel and know that that camel is sad and ask people who oppressed this camel. You know, that, that's how well he understood people's emotions. Not even people, even animals' emotions. He, he was someone who would, who would tell his wife, I know when you're angry. Even if you don't say it, I know when you're angry. Because he is able to understand emotions. He's someone who, you know, once one of the Sahaba came to him and he was very angry with that Sahabi. And you know how the Sahabi described him? He said that Rasulullah saw some smile there. But in his smile, I made out that he was angry. It was an angry smile. This is emotional intelligence. You're angry, but you're composed. You're angry, but you're controlling that anger and channeling it in a productive way. Rasulullah Sallallahu is the ultimate example of emotional control. Uh, and really, this is something that needs more, more discussion in our times. A lot of us, I see a lot of us skip this one very important stage of studying Islam. And that's studying akhlaq, studying the character of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi The methodology of the early Muslims was they would learn adab and akhlaq first before seeking help. Today, we are seeking in without any akhlaq in adab and you know, the problem is a disaster. The problem is then, you know, you go out there and you've got arrogance and you've got bad speech and you've got bad manners and that now becomes reflect, a reflection of the deen. So it's very important that we understand the character and the manners and, and the dignity that the believer is supposed to, to, to carry himself and herself with. And we learn that from the life of Rasulullah and the early Muslims and we learn it from studying akhlaq and adab with our teachers. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, there is a question in uh, YouTube by Brother Dawood Alam. Sheikh, what is your opinion on tasawwuf? 
Tasawuf. Just okay, Tasawuf. Okay. So Tasawuf is a broad term that means different things to different people. Right? <laughs> it's one of those words where you know, like the word salafi. They mean different things to different people. These terms are very vague. If you are talking about the sawuf as the field of purification of the soul, also known as Tazkiyatu Nafs, then this is an important part of our religion that everyone's supposed to do. Supposed to work on your nafs, supposed to be checking your intentions, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, working on improving your akhlaq, becoming more humble, uh, becoming more pious, doing more zikr, doing, praying more salah, doing more tahajjud. All of this is technically the sawuf. And all of this is our religion. This is our religion. Right? This is a very important part of our religion. But now if you're talking about the sawuf as, you know, that you know there's a certain guy in your city and he's saying, you know, you must come to him and give him a pledge of allegiance and follow everything he says. And if you do that, you're going to Jannah. And, you know, you have to join his clique to go to Jannah. And, you know, you start going to these type of areas, then, then it starts to get sketchy. Then it starts to say, okay, let's take a step back. Is this the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Is, is this the Sunnah? Are they teaching the Sunnah? You know, are, are they coming up with their own things? So it's 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 one of those areas where you have to use your intellect and your usul to, to be able to find the right teachers. That's what you have to find the right teachers. If you find pious people in your community who are dedicated to the Sunnah and you sit with them and you learn from them how to make the girl, how to make istighfar, how to wake up on time for tahajjud, how to pray salah with khushu, then this is the tasawwuf of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And this is something everybody needs. This is a necessary part of our religion. But if you're joining some guy's clique, some guy's cult, where he claims that he talks directly to Allah and you know he will intercede for you on the day of judgment and you know he starts coming up with new ways of worshipping Allah that you've never heard of before, this is dangerous. This is entering the, uh, the realm of bid'ah, of innovation and deviancy. I would advise you to stay away from that uh, because those groups, some of them are, some people who, who do these things may still be within Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Some of them are far away from it. It's better to stay away from, from, from that altogether. But we do need purification of the soul. Right? So by, by the soul, if you mean purification of the soul, everybody needs that. But do it according to the principles of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Do it in a way where, you know, okay, this act of worship I'm doing, the Prophet Sallallahu did the same acts of worship. The Sahaba did the same acts of worship. Don't do it in a way where you're sitting and you're doing some acts of worship and you think to yourself, where did this come from? You know, this guy just made it up and we're doing it. That, that's when you, you know, getting into the area of bid'ah. That's something, you know, we should stay away from because every innovation is misguided. So yeah, that's my answer. Allah knows best. Jazakallah, Sheikh. Now we have a question in YouTube by Brother Zakaria. Uh, I am in 30s and an interior architect. I want to end my last days in path of Allah. Where do I begin between Arabic language or Islamic studies degree? Okay. So I think if you study with IOU, you do both at the same time. <laughs> you study your Arabic with your Islamic study. So that kind of solves your problem. Uh, in general, if someone is young, I would tell them to spend two or three years just studying Arabic and then to start studying, studying Islamic studies. Because if you master Arabic, a whole new world of knowledge opens up to you. If you look at the shelf behind me, if you don't know Arabic, you can't access those books. <laughs> That's a whole world of knowledge that you can't access. So for someone who is young and, and they're just getting started, I would highly advise them to master the Arabic language as quickly as possible. And that means spending two or three years just focused on Arabic. But if you feel that, you know, you, you're at the age where you can't learn a new language that fast or that well, then start studying, you know, you know other parts of Islam. Start learning Dawah methodology. So you can start doing Dawah. You know, start learning fiqh so you can correct your practice of Islam. Start learning Aqidah so you can correct your beliefs. And learn Arabic with them. Now, one of the things that I love about IOU is that you're studying everything else with Arabic. So like in each semester, you have Aqidah, Fiqh, Tafsir, and Arabic. So you don't have to choose one or the other. You cho you're studying all of it at the same time. And while I still think studying Arabic first works better for young people, for everybody else, this is the best approach to do both at the same time. Okay. Uh... 
Jazakala Sheikh. One of the audience is asking your question, any uh, contact details. I think Islamic Ismail Kanda at the rate of uh, Ismail Kanda dot Islamic self help at the rate of yeah, Ism uh, Ismail dot Kanda at Islamic self help dot com. Right, Islamic self help dot com is my website. So just my name, Ismail dot Kanda at Islamic self help dot com. And you can also contact me through Twitter or Facebook. I check my inbox there almost daily on both of those platforms as well. So yeah, th those are the main ways to reach me. Okay, any more questions? I think uh, no more questions. Okay, if you found this beneficial and you want to learn more with me, my history course is open. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have 1,200 students and, you know, we always have space for more since it's online. Uh, it's really, I think, the only online uh, Islamic history course that covers 1,400 years and 30 videos. So, very beneficial to supplement whatever you are studying at IOU. So, you know, feel free to join me, inshallah. Okay, Brother Abu Mishari, have you joined or... I think that's all. We don't have any more questions. Jazakallah, Sheikh, for your time. Uh, okay. It was a really beneficial uh, uh, lecture. Uh, really, and uh, maybe many audience did not attend because uh, it is odd time in Saudi Arabia. Everyone leaving the office, but mm -hmm. definitely they will watch in the YouTube uh, when it is recorded. Okay, okay but yeah. whoever is watch will watch. Inshallah, it will be highly beneficial. Inshallah, Alhamdulillah. Allah accept our efforts and may make this a means of benefit for the Ummah and a means of forgiveness for our sins. Jazakir to all of you for hosting me and for giving me your time and attention and your wonderful questions. Uh, I'll sign off from my end to our Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.